Hi, everybody. I'm Audrey Moore with Audrey Helps Actors, and this is episode number 41. Having some fun with the Emmy Awards. You guys, this is a really juicy episode. I have Liz Ho on. Liz Elizabeth Ho comes on and interviews me about my experience with the Emmys. OMG. We get into it and we get real. So, I hope you love this episode. It feels very vulnerable to me because I am talking a lot about my own personal experience in a very heightened and exciting situation. So I hope that you find it valuable and it brings you some information about your future dreams of you and your one day arrival and attendance to a big award show, if not the Emmys, whatever award show you dream of attending one day. So... Yay, I'm nervous, excited. Also, I want to shout out about Self Tape May. Self Tape May starts today, Monday, May 6th. I am looking for 16 self tapes total by the end of the month. Some of you have already gotten started. I'm so excited. Don't forget to wear your safety pins so I know that it is a new audition that you're doing specifically for Self Tape May. If you have a real self tape, please go ahead and put that tape on mute because I don't want you getting in trouble for having some self-tapes up there and outing somebody's material that they don't want outed yet in your self-tape on Instagram. Posts must be on Instagram. You must hashtag self-tape May and you must at me at Audrey Helps Actors at Audrey Helps Actors on Instagram. A lot of you are doing something really smart. You are creating what's called a Finsta a fake Instagram. This is a private Instagram uh, that you guys are setting up specifically for your self tapes. I think that is a great idea for those of you who don't want to post your self tapes on your social media because the work is maybe a little bit more private or it's rough and you have some kinks that you want to work out. I totally understand that. So I think that's a great idea. So you can start a second Instagram account for you for just your self tapes. Love the idea. Super encourage it. Also, don't forget we've got prizes. We're going to do a signed towel. Audrey Helps Actors towel. Don't forget it. You're going to get a little Audrey Helps Actors button. Also, I'm going to have you on the show, which is going to be super great, even if you're not in LA. And you're going to get a one-year subscription for Frizzo. Weaudition.com, one of our sponsors, weaudition.com. If you are looking for somebody to help you do your self tapes, if you need somebody to just like be there, you can do it on weaudition.com. You can hit the record button. It will record on weaudition.com. There are lots of people who will read with you for free. And there are some really great professional coaches on there as well. So that is a great resource for you. If you want to be practicing and practicing regularly, I recommend it. I like going over just my sides and having somebody just to like practice my lines with, maybe even before I meet with a coach to actually do a self-tape. That's my personal preference. So check it out. Weaudition.com. Promo code Audrey25. I'm not going to go through iTunes reviews because we got a lot of shit to get to. I love you guys though. Send me more iTunes reviews. I love you. So just a reminder, this episode is brought to you by Weaudition.com. Promo code Audrey25. And also the one and only the magical makeup artist, Teresa Baca. You can find her on Instagram, Teresa underscore Baca on Instagram. All right. I hope you're on your way to an audition. Book it. Book it and go to the Emmys because you're so incredible. And so is the thing you're going to book. Audrey helps actors because they don't know anything. Okay, so just a quick heads up, you guys, as we're about to start, I just wanted to be very real with you and acknowledge that this is an episode about the Emmys, and it's going to sound to you a lot like I'm like, meh, partying with fabulous people is so hard, and I just want to say, like, I acknowledge that, and I acknowledge the obnoxiousness of that, and I also acknowledge the reality that there are people with, like, real hard jobs in this life, and... uh being a person who goes to the Emmys and all of what is involved with that is not one of those people. So I just want to give you like super, uh, I get it. I know I understand. And also to say that this is an episode in hopes so that when you are so fortunate as an 
to get into all these parties, to go to all these events and to go to the Emmys for yourself, you'll just have a little more understanding from my experience and the experience of those that I watched around me of what is really involved. That's my goal here. And so I hope that you find it helpful and grounding. And I hope that you are planning on going to the Emmys this year and this will be of some use to you or somebody that you love. Okay. Hi, everybody. I'm Audrey Moore with Audrey Helps Actors. And today we have... Oh, it's me, Liz Howe. <laughs> She's Elizabeth back. Howe. I'm back. We're not going to talk about pilot season, though. We're talking about me. I asked Liz to come on here and um, interview me per the Emmys life. Jesse and I wanted someone to interview me that we felt like could see themselves at the Emmys in the next year or two. And if she can't see herself, we certainly can. And what she might like to know, because uh, I already recorded, which you guys will hear later, an interview with my stylist, an interview with my publicist, that, but it was like right after the Emmys. So we were clearly still in like drama mode <laughs> about the whole thing. And so I wanted something that we could record with a little bit more time, perspective. There's no book out there about how to like get ready for a major award ceremony. It's not really there. So, you know. I feel like this is one of the versions of prom. <laughs> totally. But the stakes just feel so much higher. Okay. Here's my analogy of it. Okay? okay. I personally didn't feel this way about my wedding because the wedding, I was sort of like, come or don't come. I'm getting married to Jesse. Like, see you guys. When we finally decided that we were going to do the whole deal, even like the dress, I was like, what, like, what would I ever even want to wear on my wedding day? Like I had never thought about it. However, I have always obsessively dreamed and thought about my like Oscars, my Emmys, my Tonys, like my award show day, right? So my analogy is that it's, it's really as close to what I imagine everyone else feels at their wedding day, except everyone's getting married that day. So it's like you and 500 other brides and then all of your families. But you also don't know whether or not you actually get married. <laughs> well, 100%. <laughs> but even just like the, the, because the winning or the losing to me, and you know, like I wasn't like personally nominated, but I think like the winning or losing is its own heightened thing. But I was surprised by the emotional intensity that just permeates the whole weekend. And the only thing I can compare that to is like a wedding because everyone's sort of on high alert. You know, your your families have dreamed of this moment for you. Your friends have been planning it for a long time. It's sort of like you're not just the only one having your special day. Everybody's having their special day. And so there's a lot of emotions that come with that that I just didn't expect. So... This is a this is a good transition. Oh god, I love go. it. Here we go. Okay, we're gonna be, we'll be ready. Uh, going with the whole wedding idea. Yes. What was the timeline like? So my thing is, I when did you get nom? When did you hear you guys were nominated? Yes. When did you find out that you guys were actually going to attend? Uh -huh. And then what was that timeline in terms of like prepping your team? Mm -hmm. Um, and then the events leading up to it, meaning like. Did you have to go to like Netflix events or PR events? Yes. And then how did that end and culminate with the Emmys and the after party? Love all of those questions. Okay. So I believe that we were nominated, I think it's six, week, six weeks out is when the nominations come to par. I will preface this with because my particular show had sort of just missed the Emmys before like Emmys are in August and our show had originally come out in November. So I had lots of months to see where the trend was going with the show to be able to assess that that was a likely possibility. So I was already sort of pre planning that if I if the Emmy nominations did come out, our show was nominated, I was going to be in attendance, sort of to the degree I could, I felt prepped my team for that expectation. So if a show had maybe come out like, you know, just in time for the deadline, and hadn't had a lot of momentum beforehand, it was sort of like surprise nomination, that would have been a different experience than what I had had. So that was good. And then I had already like attended the Critics' Choice Awards. I had sort of, I had done enough of what I thought this was 
which maybe isn't to my advantage because I had like an expectation of like, I know what this is and I didn't know what this was. So that was, that was that timeline. Now, when the nominations came out, we had gotten the official invites to attend three weeks in advance. I had told my stylist is in New York City, my publicist is here, and I really wanted to make sure that those three weeks were being used wisely. And I wanted to sort of soak up as much of the publicity opportunities as possible. Because if you're going to go to the Emmys, there's all these events, as you said, that you can attend in conjunction with the Emmys and really wanting to like capitalize on all of that. I would say the biggest Emmy kerfuffle of the event was that we were told explicitly that we would be going and walking the red carpet. My stylist flew out on her own dime to come and style me. I paid for for styling, but as far as like her travel and stuff, which is pretty common, I've researched that, you know, stylists for an Emmy situation or a big award show, they they actually tend to lose money rather than gain it. And if they break even, that's pretty good. I, you know, found a place for her to stay. I was like, borrow my car, like whatever you need. The Friday before the Emmys, we got an email that we had the wrong color ticket. And so the only people who would be walking the carpet were the nominees. So I didn't know that there were different ticket levels. Exactly. I'm sure... How would you? How would I? <laughs> How right. would anyone? Yeah. Um, that makes sense because yes. in Hollywood, everything's very designated. You stay in right. your lane and your your tier. Right. If you didn't have those tickets, and obviously you weren't in control of that, right? That's right. Uh, did you have a major panic attack? What did you do with your team? Oh, I had... Uh, I had a... I mean, the breakdown was coming. Is what I'll say. Like, <laughs> it's a wedding. You're right. It's a wedding. That's what it felt like. It was like, okay, you're going to get married, but then BTW is like anything that would be major, like your lo- your venue changes, like your right. location cancels on you. Like there are plenty of people who get married who then their venue gets a better offer. And so they give you your money back and then they take the better offer for that weekend and you're without a venue, like four days before your wedding. Like I have lots of people that I know who've had that happen. So it it sort of was like that. It was like we had prepped for that moment. And yes, for me, but also for my team, you know, for my stylist, for my hair and makeup person, you know, it's a big moment for them as well, professionally. And they had taken personal and financial and professional sacrifices to make that the best that they could make out of that opportunity. So it was a really big blow. And, you know, I really tried everything I could to talk all the way up to the top of the chain. And I had other actors who talked to their people and the top of their chain. And the consensus was just, you know, we're really sorry. And that, you know, it's a lot to do with, honestly, like security issues, really. But then what was really crazy was that actually people I know who had nothing to do with being nominated. They showed up and walked the red carpet. Wild. Wild. There are all these rules and yet none None of them them matter. And a member or two of my cast just were like, fuck it, I'm going to give it a go and gave it a go. And then they walked. Did I saw photos of you. Did you get to walk? No, I didn't get to walk. I was so heartbroken, upset at the end the next day I was like, and then I was mad at myself for being heartbroken, upset, just like a wedding, you know, when if all these brides that like things don't go according to plan and then they kind of miss out on the joy of the experience of ha- having been married. And that's a little bit how I felt was that it was just so emotional and such a whirlwind that I woke up the next day just kind of like angry and also not for nothing. You're not eating that whole week, not not even because you're trying to shove yourself to fit in anything, but it's, you're just slammed. So you're not eating that whole week. You know, you're drinking, you're trying to stay hydrated. You're not sleeping because you're too excited and there's too much going on. So it's again, so much like a wedding, right? Where it's just so much going on. And so I woke up the next day and I was like, so pissed I didn't get my carpet photo. And so I just paid somebody to Photoshop me in front of the carpet and I felt a lot better. (laughs) Uh, Well, good job. I didn't know that wasn't you on the carpet. Uh, nope. 
Well done. Thank you. And you know what? Sometimes you got to do what you got to do. Well, it was really for me just about making my heart feel better. That's what what I have to say is that because the truth is, is with the exception of the fact that they had just bought the right, wrong tickets, which could have easily happened that they had just bought the right tickets, I would have walked the carpet. Or if I had just been brazen enough to just be like, well, fuck it, I'm just going to give it a go. And the only reason I wasn't brazen is because, I mean, there were lots of people who were like, I'm just telling you no, like no. And the entrance for the other people, the, we'll call them the plebes <laughs> versus <laughs> the carpet walkers, they're on opposite ends. So like when I imagined it in my head, I thought like, oh, we'll just arrive. And then when we arrive, we'll just like, we'll go, just, scoot, we'll over just that. scoot into that line. But what happens is I had my publicist and the person I was with had their, had the Netflix publicist that was in attendance with us. And you can't bring your manager. You can't bring your stylist. You can't bring your hair and makeup person. Like it's you and your publicist or the network publicist. If you're, if you're as part of like a show like that. And then they walk you to a completely separate entrance. If I were to do it over again, I would certainly just be like, we're going to give it a go. And like, you know, always, better to beg for forgiveness than to ask for permission. Just like you said, it, you all these rules and then it doesn't seem like any of them matter. From over here, I'm really proud of you for taking care of yourself oh, the day you. after and being like, I'm just going to Photoshop it. <laughs> I did and I felt so much better I'm glad. I was like, there. It's done. And you deserve it. It's a lot of That's hard work. That's how I felt. I felt I deserved my carpet photo for Christ's fucking and sake. And it's also your team. You're it not is. just repping yourself. No, I know. But my team was horribly embarrassed by the fact that I did that. But that's okay. I'm here to do me, you guys. So, you know, get on board or, or jump ship. Here's that's the thing. What I to say. Your team's still with you. So. No, absolutely. Listen, they let me. And it's like a very <laughs> clear Audrey-like quirk. I'm just like, I wanted my carpet. I'm going to get it. And yeah. yeah. I'm and glad so then you I did. It. Yeah. Okay. The week of yeah. um, leading up to it, what were parties like? What, w- what was a day-to-day for you? I just imagine you wake up, you get directly into hair and makeup, and mm. you just hit the circuit mm. in multiple outfits and hair changes. Yes. It really starts to roll like Thursday. So the degree to which you then participate, I'm really interested in like how I'll do it the next go-round. I feel it was really important for this go-round because... I do feel having those photos and stuff on IMDb and out there it makes me feel better when I'm walking into a certain caliber of room. I don't feel as much like I shouldn't be in this room, <laughs> you know, because <laughs> even if your resume says so, there's always people that I feel like have as good or better resumes. And so it's easy for me to want to count myself out as not being as marketably valuable as the person next to me. And whether it's real or not, just the idea that I think they could, they'll IMDb me and they'll see all these press photos from those major events just to me makes me feel like, I mean, I've done my job. That's all. I mean, that's all I can do is do what I think is in my control. And publicity was just one of the things I felt like was in my control. And I also didn't know when I was going to get back there. I don't know when I'm going to get back. Part of what makes it really hard is that they all come in last minute. Like everything is on fire and everything is coming in suddenly. And so you're also, it's also this really in, in a high school way, like you're talking about. I don't know if you guys did this, but I was always trying to get in all the yearbook photos. Like I just <laughs> wanted to be in every yearbook photo, right? And so it's this also kind of nasty, weird, interesting thing where everyone's hearing about everyone else's parties and everyone wants to know, like, are you going to this party? Oh, I haven't heard about that party. And so then everyone's sort of judging, like, in one night, there's four parties. So are you going to get into, like, the elite one? Or are you going to this other one that sort of anybody can get into? So then that's like a weird high school cool kids it's the Hollywood thing of, it I is. swear to God, you show up, you're having lunch with a friend, the door opens and everyone's head in the restaurant turns to yes. see if, oh, is that the person I should be having lunch with or totally. dinner with? Totally. How much of these parties came through Netflix? Mm. How much of it came through your publicist? I believe the only one that came from Netflix, which was my favorite party, was the Netflix toast of the nominees so that is at the uh one of the heads of netflix it's it was at his place and so that was one of those crazy days because i had 
the bath. Okay, so that was Saturday. So this is what my Saturday schedule looked like, you guys. Oh, because this is what was weird. The Emmys was on Monday this last year. Oh, that's weird. Because I think it had to do with the conflict of football. These were Saturday parties. And then there was this other like super elite, no cameras allowed Sunday party. So Saturday parties, I wake up at, you know, eight or seven or eight. I drive to Silver Lake to get my hair and makeup done by the girl who always does my stuff. Fantastic work. She does fantastic work. But wait, Liz, wait. You guys, later in this episode, we're going to talk about this pilot that I had an audition for. Well, Liz also had an audition for this pilot, and she booked it. So congratulations, Liz. But also wait. I have to interrupt you. We interrupt your regularly scheduled program to bring you shit you didn't know about your union. This shit you don't know about your union is brought to you by Teresa Baca, who we're talking about right now in this episode. Teresa Baca is obviously my makeup artist and hair person extraordinaire. She does makeup and hair both brilliantly. I've used her for years. If you are in the Los Angeles area and you need a great makeup and hair person for your headshots, for an event, I have hired Teresa to do my hair and makeup for agent meetings, for publicity, for headshots, for shooting, like stuff for my reel. I've used her all kinds all the time. I couldn't speak more highly about her. What's so great about her is that she has experience in all ranges, FX makeup, glam, beauty, supernatural. She knows it all. And she's an esthetician, you guys. So those of you who really need somebody to help you out with your skin, I couldn't recommend her more highly. I also recommend, you know, finding a makeup artist who you can do like a lesson with, who can teach you, especially some of you guys out there, you need some help. So just do a little private with a makeup artist. I recommend Teresa and have them show you some ways to do your hair, to maybe make yourself look more character make yourself look more a lady man. Same goes for women. If you are completely clueless about how to do a period hairdo look, then maybe you want to learn about that before you have your audition. So, you know, hiring a makeup artist in advance to help you learn how to do certain things is also a really great idea. I send tons of people her way. I couldn't recommend her more. She's a doll and a sweetheart. I love you, Teresa. You can find her at Teresa Baca on Instagram, T H E R E S A underscore B-A-C-A, Teresa Baca. Her email address is on there, as well as pictures of all of her incredible work. Okay, so this shit you don't know about your union, this is going to be very quick. Voting for the commercials contract, I need you to do it by May 8th. That's the deadline. May 8th, I am voting yes on the commercials contract. If you have not yet Listen to the episode with me and Katie and Katie. I need you to listen to it. It's, I promise you, such a good episode. Vote yes on the commercials contract. You should have gotten a little postcard in the mail. It has a little pin number for you to vote. May 8th, the commercials contract. Vote yes on the commercials contract. It's really, you guys, it's it's really great. I'm really excited about it. All right. I love you. And now back to your regularly scheduled program. So Saturday parties, I wake up at, you know, eight or seven or eight. I drive to Silver Lake to get my hair and makeup done by the girl who always does my stuff. Fantastic work. She does fantastic work. I have four parties to go to that day. So she has to do my hair and makeup to last. It's now 9 a.m. and it has to last well until two or three o'clock in the morning. It's truly a wedding. It's truly a wedding. That's exactly right. So another thing is, because I'm local, I'm in Los Angeles, I didn't get like a driver. Now, some of the other people who are being, who they weren't being flown in, let's make that clarity. Uh, they were said, okay, well, you come to the Emmys, we want you there, but we will not be paying for uh, lodging. lodging or travel. To LA. To LA. But they did give, which is a uh, common for when you're in a nominated group, you get what's called the glam budget. So the glam budget can be anywhere from, you know, $500 to like several thousand. So we were given a $1,500 glam budget for the whole weekend, just for the Emmys. Okay. So you could, if you had the right people, spread that out, right? But it's really, it's just, it's just taking your total cost and minusing $1,500 for the whole weekend, right? 
So your total costs include the hair and makeup to every event you're going to go to, the stylist to find clothes and such for you for every event you're going to go to. For women, all the shapewear that you have to buy so for much. every single outfit. And that shit is really expensive. Shoes, because you don't get loan shoes usually because they get scuffed and they can't resell them and they can't do anything with them again. So you have to usually go and get your own shoes. And then all the other stuff of like, you know, nails, all that stuff. So back to the driver. So some of them who had come were given a driver, at least to like the Netflix party. But because I'm here, I got no said driver. So, <laughs> so did you just hop over to their house? So here's what I did <laughs> was I hired a girl to drive me around all day. And shout out to Jennifer. Like she was so, I, I can't tell you how grateful I was for her. I go, she picks me up at my makeup artist and I have, now I have all four outfits sitting in her car the whole time. Put outfit number one on and then we go to the BAFTAs and then I'm at the BAFTAs. And your publicist meets you there. My publicist was meeting me at the BAFTAs. I could pick her up or meet her there. Got it. And your manager didn't go with you to my any My manager of these. was shooting a series on location in Atlanta. I was there with my trusty, wonderful publicist. And I don't know what I'm doing, you guys. I just want to make clear, like, Audrey helps actors, but I, I had no idea what I was doing. And there's all this weird stuff of like, what time you get there, and then how long the line is, and then do you make it through the line? And, you know, I wanted to take pictures with other girls in the Godless cast. And everyone was like, no, I need you to start to separate yourself from Godless because I want you to be Audrey Moore, who was in Godless and all these other things, rather than the Godless cast, including Audrey Moore, right? So like, that's shit I would never have thought about or known about or anything. So go to the party. It's really weird. I saw Henry Winkler. I was like, hey, what's up? And I have this thing because obviously I'm really social that I'm like, hey, <laughs> you're so great. Can I take a photo with you? And I also know, like, I'm a young woman in a fantastic dress. Like, they're not going to say no to me. So I was just like geeking out a lot. And I'm really not shy with asking the camera people to take photos of me. Like, if somebody's holding a press camera, I'm like, hey, take a photo of me. <laughs> and then they did. Then I'm whisked off the Netflix party, which is the one that I was invited to by Netflix. So BAFTAs, I got through publicist. Netflix invited. I go to Netflix. Oh my God, you guys, that was like the most fun. It was what, so What cool. made it the most fun? Everyone Cool was there. It was so cool. And and most of these things, Everyone Cool is there, but it, there's so many people that you can't like really see people or mingle or talk to them. This was really cool because it was all of the people on Netflix and everyone who wanted to be on Netflix. And because Game of Thrones was ending, anyone who could was like, please get me into the Netflix events, right? So... I hung out with Tina Fey. I heard that Diane Keaton was inside. I was like, I got to meet Diane Keaton. I didn't. I didn't want to act like a crazy person. But I, I love that's where you drew the line. <laughs> no. Because she's inside in like the private room. Right. Everyone at least is outside. I'm talking to like all the act Because here's the thing, Liz, is like, it's all these nerdy actors. Like, that's what it is. It's like nerdy creative types in this really small environment. And the Fab Five were there. Like, it was just really silly and really fun. Then... I have to leave because I have been invited to the nominee party to honor the nominees by, God, I don't remember who it was, but it's like the party that night to honor the nominees. So I got invited to that. I'm being told by my publicist, like, they're going to close the carpet. If we don't go now, like, you're going to lose it. So I'm like a crazy person. Again, change in the car. Like, so far, this is my second change in the car, Right. All those years of changing into it your, doesn't change. your dance outfit from school and your mom being like, get in the car. Here's a snack. Yeah. To all those times where you're also like changing in your, the car for your auditions, like the changing in the car, I'm here to tell you, doesn't seem to change or evolve. <laughs> so I'm changing in the car. Sweet Jennifer is driving me over. I get to the party. I'm really nervous. I'm going to lose the carpet. I like run, 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 run to the carpet. My publicist is, is like, do not run to the carpet. But I'm like in panic bride mode. And I'm like, oh my God, I got to go. So then we learn another thing, which is about your dresses and your outfits. So here's something I wish somebody had told me. 
when you go to any party, these designers, I was given BTW jewelry to wear for the weekend, plus these shoes, plus all the stuff, plus the dresses. And they're doing it because you're going to end up in photos that they're then going to publicize. And I didn't realize like what I need to do is I need to get to a party. And the first thing is I need to take the best picture of that dress. And then also every party now has like a photo booth kind of thing. Go to the photo booth, get a great picture and all the stuff. And then do all the mingling and do all of the like schmoozing, right? Now I learned this because I showed up to the carpet for this super elite party. My dress was fucked up, you guys. Like it is this beautiful trumpet bottom and it was all crumpled and crinkled and everyone's like, it's fine. And I'm like, oh, okay, because I feel like it's crumpled and crinkled. And that poor designer, I looked so good in that dress. And they were posting all these dresses from the weekend. And I didn't get posted because it just didn't show off the dress, which I felt was too bad because I'm always looking to help out other artists. So I'm there talking to people, making friends, whatever, whatever. And then it's whisked away to the TBS party. Again, gotten to me by my publicist. Now it's probably like 1130 at night. Here's what people don't realize about me. I'm actually not a partier. I'm very extroverted. You're very social. I'm very social, but like, I'm not, I'm not a party person. Like I'm a sleep, I'm a sleeping person. I love sleep. <laughs> Give it up for naps, yo. <laughs> Nap time. <laughs> what? So I go to this party. I walk, we get out of the car and immediately I run into Kaylee Cuoco and her brand new husband. And I'm like, OMG, Kaylee, what's up? Loved your wedding. You wore a cape. I'm a little jelly because I wanted to wear a cape and you've already done it and blah, blah, blah. How's your dogs? Blah, blah, blah. And she was like, hey, girl, hey. So that was fun. Then we start talking to other people. All these celebrities are there. Liz, I'm so burnt out. It's now like one o'clock in the morning. My publicist is still making the fabulous rounds. I'm by the pool <laughs> with my feet in like this jacuzzi type hot tub. It's at this house in like the hills and I'm just soaking my feet because I've been in heels now since like 11 and it's now like one o'clock in the morning and these are not comfortable heels. Shout out to Teresa, my hair and makeup on point. And I'm just like, you have to post all day. You have to tag every single dress. You have to tag all the shoes. You have to tag all the jewelry. And so it's like one o'clock in the morning and I'm just sitting there by the pool posting. I have a question. Answer. So I'm, could your manager, or you're not your manager, your publicist have done some of the social media stuff? Or is this something that you really like to have control over? I think, honestly, I would probably have to hire a social media person. It's okay. not, it's not your publicist's job. I mean, when I, that's, it's such a great question of like, what is your publicist's job and what is not your publicist's job? It's just right? very nebulous. It is. Right now, especially since social media is like this crossover between what is PR, yeah. what is yeah, what's yours, right? right. And you know, I had so many friends with so much drama that weekend from what they posted and didn't post and who they tagged and forgot to tag. It's like, it's always on fire about that shit. And so, um, that was a lot. That was, that was an exhausting lot. I just learned so much just listening to these stories. Um, maybe, maybe listen to you too. Yes. Yeah. Um, just in terms of like show up, you have to look your, I'm going to swear fucking best. Yes. Did I, I'm never going to stop swearing. And make sure that you Google the event from last year so that you know what is appropriate for this particular moment, right? Yep. Because we actually kind of accidentally- Oh, that was me. That was you. We asked, so you show up, you have to take the best photo. Yes. And then you need to take photo booth photos and group photos. Yes. And then you- mingle because you're human and you want to drink and eat tiny food that, you really should i mean it's it's this interesting thing Liz, between like what are we really here for right like to what degree are you there to then take these pictures to them post them so you can give all these designers a shout out to help you look great for less but also i need to be I need to be talking to the showrunners i just shot with i need to be talking to the writer the director like i need to be doing my own like authentic networking. So you take the photos, you do your networking, right. you post that shit, you tag, yes. then you run to the next thing. In your car, you change, you put on brand new undergarments, by the way, because each dress has a different requirement. You got to touch up that makeup. Yep. 
and then you got to do it all over again. Yeah. It really is a job. It's it's a job and it's an expense. It's expensive. That's the other thing I want to talk about. So then Sunday, there was like the elite party where like only the nominees come and blah, blah, blah. Now, I'm not the nominees. It's like no pictures allowed. It's supposed to be quote unquote casual and just sort of for the nominees to come and just sort of like- It's like what Vanity Fair used to it's be. It's exactly that, right? I didn't get invited to that party. I probably could have found a way, but honestly, Liz, I was so fucking tired by then. <laughs> I was so tired and I knew that I was getting grumpy and like how I know myself and how people, what people expect from Audrey is like a lot of enthusiasm, a lot of energy, a lot of care, kindness. And when I'm tired, you guys, that shit goes out the fucking window. So I rested all day Sunday. What else? Any other thoughts, questions? Money. That was my big thing. The money is the big thing. over here for me, I'm looking at this, I'm seeing the week. Mm-hmm. I also, okay, let's ask the money question first. How much total for, I would say, from when you got the invitation forward? Okay, so I would say uh, I already did the calculations, as you know, of course I would. Of course you did. And so this is not, so, so, so the total cost is what I'm going to give you of, of the total expense, including my publicist that I paid for the week because I, you know, you guys got to pay your people. Listen to me. So many of you like want to hire people for free. And I just think like, go fuck yourself because they are working. She worked her fucking ass off that week. And she had to go to every single party that I had to go to. She was emailing every single person trying to get things. You know, we got published in people. We got a lot of, um, articles of things that I had worn and such. And like, that's all her, right? And so pay your people, right? Not just because they deserve to get paid, but also for the long-term relationship. So paying her, uh, paying for the stylist, paying for the undergarments, the shoes, all of that sort of stuff, paying for- Hair and makeup. Hair and makeup for each day, if not each event. Shoes, you said shoes, yeah, right? Shoes, transpo. Transpo. If that's something that you got to do, then transpo. So, all total, just over thirty five hundred dollars for the weekend. Now oh, that's so much better than I thought it okay. was going to be. But I want you to remember that I did that shit on a budget, and so how how I, I how I could have spent more money is all those things that I was doing myself, like going downtown and getting the undergarments, doing all that stuff. Like, ideally, I would be able to pay somebody more to have a style assistant who then goes and does all that stuff. But then the amount I'm paying for my stylist goes up, right? Because I'm paying for more manpower. I could have had a hair and makeup artist come and meet me in the morning instead of me going to them. And so... The, but that's going to be more expensive for them to come to you than for you to go to them, right? Have you heard of that the triangle, which is like time, quality, and money? And you can't get 100%. all three. Yes, you can get right. two, but that's you can't right. get all three. Right. So, yes. And so now Netflix did give me the $1,500 stipend. So subtracting that, just over two grand. Not a bad deal. But just know when you're excited about going to the Emmys, if you are a person who is as resourceful and as hardworking as Audrey Moore is, two grand. And here's what I want to say. We haven't even gotten to the dress yet. And I and I want to just say this is not just my sole experience. As you guys know, I'm friends with lots of series regulars, lots of people who are nominated, lots of different shows. And it seemed to be a consensus. Like everyone by and large was shocked by how emotional and stressful the whole thing is. Right. And also, I want to say for women, I don't know about men, you guys wear a suit and you show up like it's different for you. But for us, it's like a whole thing. Right. So the dress. Okay. Here's what I want women to know in particular about the whole carpet situation is that it's really emotional. And it's emotional because we all have body issues. We all have things that we like and dislike about our body. And, you know, I've really come to surrender my body type and I believe in the magic of wardrobe and all that stuff. But in order for you to get designer samples, you have to be a zero to a two. I am not a zero to a two. In a dress, I'm a size six. Well, at five foot ten, a size six is great by any standard, 
But when we're talking about getting designer stuff sent to you, that's a different thing. So it's really emotional because what happens is all these clothes come to me, you know, my stylist brings them all together and we try them on and a lot of them just don't fit. Even though the designers say they're a size six, they just don't fit. We had tried on all these dresses for us that were a size six. And, and when did you try these on? Here, I had set my living room up as a, uh, you know, I set up a giant rod yeah, 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 yeah. for all the wardrobe stuff. To and be this there. was how many days before the event? So she showed up, I believe, on Thursday. Okay, so so it was for Monday was days. the yeah. Okay. So she shows up on Thursday. We try on all the dresses except for the one that we're certain we're going to wear on the actual day. And we don't try that one on because she wanted to like steam it and make sure it was like really nice and perfect so that we get the full thing. We try on all these other ones and they're all size sixes. They all fit. So we're like, great. Then I think it was like late that night. We tried on like the dress and it won't even go over my shoulders. This is a nightmare. It was a nightmare. I'm sweating right now. It was, it was a nightmare. It. it was a total and complete nightmare. Also, I'm I'm in with a group of girls, so I know what colors all the other girls are wearing, and I don't want to wear the same color as one of the other girls. And I've already been like, I'm gonna wear blue, so I can't be like, I'm gonna wear blue. Oh, except you're wearing red, but I'm gonna wear red because that's the one that fits me right now. So those are weird things that you don't think that you have to think about, except that you do. So they contact the designer, they see what we can do, they start, you know, we find out that they have uh, stitched it to make it smaller. So we let out, with their permission, some of the seams, we let out even more seams because it was lined. And if we just had to cut out the lining and just have the dress, still, I mean, we get over my shoulders, but it is not going over my hips. Again, I'm still sweating. No, disaster. I mean, disaster nightmare. So you guys, in three days, I had to from scratch get a dress made. That's wild. And thank God you already have a great relationship. That's it. Now, so those of you who don't know, I have a seamstress and des and designer that I work with regularly, have already been working with uh, for a year and a half at that point. And we have a great relationship. She knows my body. She knows what looks good on my body. She knows what I feel comfortable in. We go downtown to downtown LA. They have all these incredible, for those of you who are interested, they actually have these, it's basically they're like knockoffs of like, you know, BCBG and all that sort of stuff. And some like just more independent designers. And the dresses are like $400, $500. And we go and try those ones on. And we're just not finding anything that's like really wowing anybody. And this is Friday you're doing this? This is Friday I'm doing this. Okay. And I have four parties to attend on Saturday and a, and two parties, I think, to attend on Friday night. So uh, we find fabric after walking around in downtown LA. For, and this is you, your stylist. And my, and my designer seamstress. And your designer. Okay. And we also are going to showrooms to try things on. But showrooms, again, everything has to be a size two. And then you go to the rack of like things that might actually fit you. And now it's the Friday before the Emmys. So it's all gone. It's all picked through. Right. right? So we find this fabric and... I'm like a BTW. I still have my auditions. I still have my self tapes. I'm like, you know, spending three hours on the middle of Thursday to like do this huge feature film lead self tape that I had to do. Right. Uh, we find this fabric and, you know, she in like a day comes up with like a mock up of, uh, you know, for a fitting, she comes over Saturday morning to fit. She comes over Sunday morning she's to fit. She's a beast. Fit. She's a fucking beast. She doesn't sleep. Meanwhile, she's doing all that work. And remember, she's doing all this work with the understanding that she's going to get her dress on the carpet. Right. Friday afternoon, we get the news. No carpet, which is heartbreaking for all of us. Right. Right. You know, she does all this really beautiful work. It's really great. And if you see the dress on you know, my Instagram, it's I, I can't tell you, like, I'm so proud, but I feel so devastated that I couldn't even give it its proper um, love and attention because I was just so freaked out. Honestly, I was just freaked out. And, you know, it's something that, you know, my, my stylist is now getting married. And so she has this pressure to like have the one magical dress. 
and it's a lot of pressure she's finding. And I'm like, well, now you know how all of us feel because to you, it's just, you're finding another dress for another girl. But for us, it's like, it's like our dress. And if two days before your Emmys, you don't have a dress to wear, you might panic. So I was just emotional and panicked. Uh, you know, we got it done. It came out, it came out beautiful. I'm so excited because it was like, uh, it had a detachable um, train. So now the actual dress I had modified just slightly. I wear it all the time now. Uh, I can She's wear She's wearing it right now, you guys. <laughs> not, but <laughs> I could if I wanted to. And I turned the train into a, into a jacket that goes over it. Well, it first, I believe, was a blanket for your manager. <laughs> yes, that's true. I did um, take the train off and just in the after party of Netflix, I, I just caped it over everybody and took pictures because that's how I would roll. It's like your superhero cape. It was. And I want you to know, so my designer and, and seamstress, she did not charge me for that dress. I purchased the fabric and she didn't charge me for the dress because if she was designing it for somebody for a show that you traditionally don't charge because of the publicity, that's crazy. And that was easily a two, $3,000 dress. I mean, to get something custom made like that in the fabric and the fabric I think was, I think all told was like $400 for the fabric. That's crazy. Because I'm a giant, you guys. Yeah. So like every time I'm like, I got 10 yards and she's like, it's too much. And then she always comes back and it's like, how many yards did you get? And I'm like 10. She's like, cause I barely had enough. And I'm like, I'm telling you, I'm, I'm a giant. It, takes it just a lot of makes me think about all these uh, designers who recently on social media get are getting called out mm. for not dressing real women. Yes. And not only that, I would say the degree to which having a relationship set up ahead of time is so valuable and so important. Because if you wait until you need it, I think you're fucked. Yeah. I think you're fucked. You know, and also the big thing, my whole life, this is where like judgy comes to bite me in the ass. My whole life, I was like, why is everyone so fucking boring on a carpet? Like, what the fuck? Why is everyone so fucking boring? Like, do something interesting, you guys. Don't be so fucking boring. And I told Danny, I was my stylist. I was like, oh, I get why it's everyone's so boring. She's like, yeah, because at the end of the day, if you're not, you know, Zendaya at six foot one and like, you know, a model body, you have to have a lot of preparation to make something look both flattering and interesting. And it's all such a shit show. You more than likely are just not going to have the time to put that together. I'm so behind this body positivity movement. Oh, and God. just like, I just, I hope that I, again, now like my mind's all jumbled, but I'm also sure. thinking about the pyramid of time, money yes, and quality. And yes. just like, if you don't take the time to establish these relationships, I can see that happening for me. Mm -hmm. Having to be like, an, you know, you were really thrifty. I can see myself spending way triple that amount. I easily. think so. But wait, Liz, wait. You guys, later in this episode, we're going to talk about this pilot that I had an audition for. Well, Liz also had an audition for this pilot and she booked it. So congratulations, Liz. But also wait, I have to interrupt you. Help me, help me, I need some help. And now it's time for listener questions. I'm so scared here. This listener question is brought to you by weaudition.com. That's weaudition.com. I already said a lot about we audition. You guys, promo code Audrey25. That's promo code Audrey25. You get 25% off your subscription to weaudition.com. I can't recommend it more highly. You guys, you need to be practicing and learning your lines and working on it and just becoming more and more facile. So I super recommend it. Weaudition.com, promo code Audrey25. So this listener question, I'm actually not going to play over Google Voice because I think it's best anonymous. I got a call from somebody who wanted me to discuss with the listeners proper protocol of reaching out to somebody's agent that you know. I just want you guys to know that if you have a contact, a friend who's with an agency, somebody that you really like, and you reach out to their agent and you drop their name without that person's permission, I just want you to know that it doesn't look good on you. It looks a little bit trashy. It looks a little bit shady. And 
it always comes back around to the client that's actually with the rep. Now, I've had this happen to me before. I have had people that I've met on set and I've talked to them about my reps and they've reached out to me and said, hey, you know, can I go ahead and ask for you to give your reps an email on my behalf and I'd love to see if I could sign with them. And, you know, a lot of the time I'm actually not comfortable with uh, presenting them to my representation as an option. And I'm not going to respond back all the time about why I'm not going to do that. And that's not because they were, you know, bad actors or bad people. Just I know sort of what my reps are looking for. And then they have gone ahead and contacted my reps uh, behind my back and said, hey, you know, I worked with Audrey on such and such. I know she speaks so highly of you. And I wanted to reach out to you and discuss representation. And so even though they're not saying, Audrey said that I could reach out to you. They're still using me as a conduit. And especially if I haven't replied back and you've reached out to me, then it's kind of, it's a dodgy move is what I would say. It's not, it's not using, you know, trust, I would say, and grace. And I know that the temptation to hustle is real and, you know, you know, fuck rules and you got to do what you can. But it's a fine line between persistence and annoyance and taking a risk and uh, being dodgy. And I know that that's not always a line that actors have the ability to see. But I want you to know from personal experience. And now listen, this hasn't happened to me recently. This happened to me a few times years ago, but it is happening to people that I know. And the reps don't appreciate it. And then your friends also don't appreciate it. So I just wanted to share that word of wisdom with you guys, that if there is somebody whose rep you would like to reach out to, protocol is you reach out to that somebody and you say, hey, can you pass my stuff along to your rep? If they do not respond, please you know, get the message. If you want to reach out to them again and they continue to not respond, then definitely get the message and do not then ignore that message, even if it's them not responding to you and go around them and contact the rep anyway and drop their name. Because I promise you the rep is going to contact the talent and say, hey, do you know so-and-so, they dropped your name, blah, blah, blah. Why did they reach out to me? Because basically, if your friend didn't respond and say, hey, I'd love to give your materials and I'd love to push them forward, I'd love to do that, then the answer is no, in fact, they would not love to do that. And there's a myriad of reasons why that could be that have nothing to do with you or your talent or your resume. And... It can have to do with the talent that the actor and them maybe not feeling super secure in their relationship with their rep or, you know, maybe they know who they're looking for and people don't always have the time to respond to you via email. So just do me a favor, you guys, and have a little trust and also just follow those words of wisdom with regards to tact. I know getting an agent is hard, but you know, doing it correctly and using your relationships correctly, I promise you is far more valuable than acting in scarcity and uh, sort of being a little bit shady or a little bit dodgy. But I love you. And now back to your regularly scheduled program. So that brings me to what I, I want to like close as like the biggest emotional epiphany that I had, which I really want to share with everybody because I don't want you to be in shock and awe like I was. Um, First of all, I sat through the first 20 minutes of the Emmys sobbing. (laughs) I would totally do that. I was sobbing. I have to say, I weirdly have never experienced such a, a beautiful joy as like watching Merritt and Jeff win their Emmys because, you know, I was there with them on set and I saw the work and I saw 
as an actor, really getting to watch masters do masterful work. And I love Merit so much because she's a contemporary, you know, she got started quite young, but you know, her hours on set are unparalleled and she is fucking fantastic. And Jeff crushed it in that show. I was sitting there for the first 20 minutes crying and I was so glad that I wasn't sitting right behind the nominees. They put us like to the back and over to the side because they would have like cut to beautiful Michelle Dockery's face and Audrey would have been like super ugly crying behind them because I think like how I imagine people getting married, it's really emotional. Like when I got married, I was like in my robe, guests were showing up and I was out there like, hey, what's up? I was like, what are you doing here? And I was like, whatever, like, let's hang out. But this to me was like just emotional sobbing. Also the scarcity of it, you know, like you don't know when you're going to be back there again. And it's so just like when you, when you get your first co-star and you're freaked out the whole fucking time, you're just sure like, is this real? Are they going to take it away from me? It's imposter syndrome. It's total imposter syndrome, which I've, you know, I've experienced, I get every time I get up another rung. And so that is still going to happen at these shows. Like you're going to be there in my experience. And I was so glad that I could have that because all the nominees and stuff were really quite composed. And that made me realize like, maybe not as emotionally prepared and ready for this tier as I thought that I was. And I will be next time. But like, I was glad I felt like I had like a good dry run of like what this was. They were going to shove me kind of in the back right and let us cheer. And I could sob. Oh, BTW, your makeup artist, my makeup artist is the only one who did this. So your makeup artist needs to make a kit for you. This should be a kit with a little bit of powder on a powder thing, a little uh, thing of your lipstick, a little bit, all these things. They should give you safety pins, some mints. I had a kit and all the other girls were like, do you have any powder? And I was like, it's my kit. Because <laughs> I was like, this is going to last until three o'clock in the morning. But, you know. I'm surprised I wasn't in the bathrooms like at a wedding. Oh, I was in the bathroom uh, crying and my phone went off because I couldn't find it. So I, cause it was chaos and I had my phone. I did the find my iPhone where it goes boom, 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 boom. I'm in the bathroom where I thought I left it using like an attendance th phone to find my iPhone. And apparently they started the in memoriam <laughs> and my phone was like, Boom, 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 boom. And so all my girls were like, ah, no, dream, no. So it was fine. It, it all worked out. Oh, BTW, other really weird thing, Liz. All your alcohol and everything they charge you for doesn't matter who you are. I was standing in line with Elizabeth Moss and her manager. And like champagne is like $40 a glass. You can't see my face, but I, I did it's like horrifying. definitely a meme where they like, what? <laughs> this is I have the same thing. And I just wish somebody had told me like, you're gonna, it doesn't bring matter. Cash. Yeah, bring cash and maybe drink beforehand or, you know, smoke a little something because uh, none of that is shit is free. It doesn't matter who you are. Apparently after you win, you go downstairs and then there's stuff downstairs. So 10 people get to eat and drink. 10 people get to eat and drink at the Nokia Theater for Frizzle. So is it the Nokia? I don't know where it is. LA Live, that's where it is. Okay, but the big thing is this realization I had that like the Emmys, this is gonna sound really naive, you guys, but I'm gonna give it to you. It's a show to sell commercials and so how that relates to you the actor is they nominate shows you then spend several thousands of dollars to participate in this circus to which then they take pictures and video of you in this circus and then they sell the commercials and they take the money Listen, I'm super glad that we have those opportunities in our business, that there is like a system in place to honor us and our work. I think artists, you know, we work really selflessly, whether our reputation says it or not. And I think where I had like a real depression for a month or so was, I was like, okay, so let's talk brass tacks, like what you were saying, like the cost versus what you get out of it, right? I'm going to be on a show that hits and let's say just so it's an even number that you get paid a hundred grand to be on this show per episode or just this in whole? general, okay. we'll just say in general, it's a flat number of that hundred grand, 10 grand is going to your rep. 
right? 10 grand is going to your manager and then maybe five, five grand is going to your lawyer. So you're now at $75,000. Cost of living in Los Angeles is about $50,000 a year. So you now have $25,000 left over. A cycle of publicity is probably going to run you anywhere from ten to $30,000. And then you go to the Emmys, right? Now you do this cycle of publicity so that you can stay and remain competitive. But I started to see like math wise, okay, well, if I'm making this money and then I'm just making enough for me to really to live, and then I have to spend the rest of this money to stay relevant so that I can just do the acting, I'm still not like building wealth. I'm not growing You're in the my, red. I'm in the red. I'm not growing capital, right? And I just pose this to you guys, for those of you who have the dreams of like making it to the Oscars or making it to the Emmys, because what you're essentially saying is I want to be acknowledged publicly for my work, which I think is beautiful, but also realizing so that they can sell commercials, which again, I've done lots of commercials. I'm all for capitalism. I want it. But perhaps there is, it is when you're stressing yourself out and you're being mad at yourself about where you are or not, I'm here to tell you, you could do really great work that you were really proud of in a different market and not pursue it in the way that I'm pursuing it, Liz is pursuing it in Hollywood. You could still do incredible work and you would maybe even walk away with more money from it. It's all about priorities, what's important to you. That's what I'm saying is I just want you guys to sort of be aware of like, It seems to me like if I was going to like live in Louisville, do theater in Louisville, make great theater town, great theater town, town. uh, make Louisville theater money, not a ton of money in it, but cost of living, not particularly high. You could probably buy a house. You could probably buy a house. You could continue to do the great works that have been written and are being written currently. And you could have that life which could be very artistically fulfilling to you. Or you could come to Los Angeles. <laughs> we just like locked eyes and we're like, ha 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 you could pursue this dream, which to me is very clearly a dream that has been created by the industry to say anyone can be royal, but all the jewels are, are, are loaned out to you. All of the dresses are loaned out to you. We're all going and driving in our crap out cars later, you know, hoping to save gas mileage, hoping to have time for your auditions. Like the getting treated like royalty is still a few and far between thing. When you're thinking about your dream, I want you to do like a cost benefit analysis of what the dream really is. Like I really love mastery and I really love working with masters And I love the chase of things being just a little bit out of my reach. Like I love that and I find it really fun, but that's a different thing than necessarily just loving acting. I have a question that you can maybe slide in earlier. I'd love to. Yeah. So you've done the Emmys. Yes. Have you seen any opportunities come from that in terms of your career? Because that's kind of the idea, right? Right. You do the award shows, you get the publicity so that you are seen in market. And so that casting, showrunners, networks, studios see mm-hmm. you and go, ah, Audrey. Or when you're in the room, go, let's Google her. Yes. And let's see that. Have you seen any of that pay off? I yet? would say the jury's very much still out on that. I feel a lot of that is is a lot of just internal stuff. Like, I feel like I've done my work. Um, But I will say we're coming to the tail end of pilot season and I've had one pilot audition this year. And the year before I had, I think two. And the year before, I think I, I think I had one uh, and I booked it. And you know, the one that I had this year, they really loved me. And they said, they, we will probably bring her to producers. All I know how to do is the work that I know how to do. And I've done my work. 
If I was sitting in the place that I'm sitting in now and I hadn't done all that work, I would worry and wonder if that was in the way. And so I can at least sit very confidently and actually fairly calmly about where I am and know like, it's not because of me. It's, you know, I have a fantastic reel and a great resume and I have invested in publicity and I have articles out there and I have pictures out there and I work on my work. I'm not like a lazy actor who's just hanging out with their thumb up her ass. Just, I mean, that's a different, you know, sometimes, but look, you know, don't kink shame. Don't kink shame. <laughs> I'm not here to kink shame all your ass thumb people out there. But for me, it's like, you know, you guys know I really do work on my work still. Like I am still really passionate about continuing to get better and I'm inspired by certain people and how good they are. And I'm still working to to stay at uh, my, my best game, however that game shifts. Yeah, that's just how it rolls. And now pilot season is also a weird... Yeah, it's a shit show. It's also just, it's old, it's antiquated, just like so we were agree. talking about... I so agree. Publicists and the studio system. And it's how it all works. It just new media has changed the game. It it's has. now year long casting. Absolutely. Um, for less and less money. But the thing that you idealize in your head at each level that you go to, I may get so many emails like, I just got my second co star. I'm hoping to level it leverage it for like better rep. And I'm like, nobody cares about your second co star. I know that you care a lot about it, but nobody else cares about it. And so it's just a continual discovery of that, like, okay, well, I was on this Emmy nominated show and, you know, have done my, I've done my, I've done my work, you know, even in like reaching out to casting, you know, before pilot season uh, started just before I had all this leftover um, specialty sodas, like from, you know, the soda shops from the wedding. And I put them all in little like soda carrying wood baskets and I dropped them off to, you know, 10 cast directors that I know and love and was like, just got married. Like I'm viral now. And like, here's some soda, you know, and nothing. Cool. That was an upper. <laughs> <laughs> but I think it's so important, Liz, because what else can I do? There's nothing. Like, you know, what else can I, and if there's something else I can do, you know, you better believe I'm going to do it. But I think I don't regret having spent the time, energy and money on that publicity. Uh, I think the jury is still out on whether or not that is going to prove a valuable return on my investment. My, just in terms of your career. I just want to be right. completely, completely, completely right. opaque about that. Yeah. But I do feel that if I were to be up for another series and... I feel that I would feel more confident in my negotiation power because I have all that stuff up there. I would feel better about being like, no, fuck you, pay me. Because I understand in a business sense what it costs to be a working actor. And so I would want to make sure that those costs are covered. Like, do not hire me for your series and then not pay me adequately and then expect me to then pay a bunch of that money out to publicize your show. No, I'm going to publicize your show. So you better pay me a little extra for it. Even in like a feminist way, like that's going to be more expensive than the cost of that publicity for your male actor. And so I need you to compensate me accordingly because I have a really high cost. Um, what would that even be called? I have a high cost period. I, I guess it would be not extras, but I don't know. Listen, no, you figure it out for high, us. You're probably cost, yelling at us yeah, right now right. in your car, like screaming. And we're screaming with you. Cost demand. It's like a higher, my, my costs are higher. What is it called when you're like a <laughs> writer? You have a, a higher cost writer? Uh, um, sure. Whatever that is, that's what I've got. That's what you got. Does that make sense? It does. And from over here, it also is one of these things too, where as an actor, we're always... I don't know if we're always, but at least for me, yeah. I've always been at like, oh, I'm not good enough or yeah. like, oh, I don't want to mess up and be on, like what we were talking about earlier. Right. I want to be on set. Yeah. And I, I feel like the actor always feels like they're in the lesser position of right. power. The and, position. Right, right. Instead of being like, I am worth this much. Right. 
this is how much you should pay me. Mm -hmm. This is how much I'm worth and where I am in terms of my career and what I know the cost will be at the end of the day. And I hope that people listening can hear what your experience has been and be able to take that into negotiations for themselves. I hope so. I mean, I think about my friends who have kids and they do such a better job at asking for what they need because it's not about them and it's easier for them to ask for what they need to provide for their family when they wouldn't maybe necessarily ask for that for themselves. But being able to say like, okay, if you're going to give me a hundred grand for this show, just as a round number, and I'm going to lose 25 grand off the top. And then cost of living in Los Angeles is $50,000. Well, I now only have $25,000 to pay for my publicity of myself and this show which you want me doing. And so then I don't have any money for like a dry year that might happen if this show gets canceled or doesn't go. I'm not going to have any money to invest in any kind of passive income or retirement or fix my car or any of those sorts of things that are things that we should be financially setting ourselves up for and holding ourselves accountable for. And it makes it easier for me to be like, well, here's the math. I'm going to need X amount more because I basically want you to pay for my publicity. I'll actually be the one paying for it, but I'm going to need you to pay for it. Yeah. Right. Also listening to this makes me think about how this business can be such high highs and low Mm -hmm. lows. Mm -hmm. And I'm grateful for having someone like you in the podcast sphere Mm -hmm. to kind of like say, these are the high highs and these Mm -hmm. are the low lows. Mm -hmm. You do not have to do it this way. Right. Or we can all acknowledge that they're high highs and low lows. Yes be mentally, physically, and emotionally prepared for that. Yeah. I mean, I'm embarrassed, quite honestly, about how I handled the whole um, weekend, but not only a touch because, you know, I can't, I can't expect to win a battle that I've never fought before. Like, I'm a really fast learner. And once I know what this, I, when I know the game, I can play it to the best of my ability. But if I don't know the game, then I'm just going to go in and cry for the first 20 minutes. You know, like (laughs) that's just what it is. And I just, I really don't want you guys to take away from this that I'm at all like, fuck the Emmys or at all like any of that. I just want you guys to have like a brass tacks understanding of what my experience of the whole thing was so that when that becomes your reality, that you have as much information as possible so that you can execute to the best of your ability, which is what I want you to be doing for every part of your career. When you're going in for a new office, I want you to ask around, like, anyone know about that office? I auditioned for this show, and they were doing, it was a kid's show, and you know how they do laugh tracks in a kid's show? Yes. Okay, so the casting director in the middle of my audition was doing the laughs. <laughs> she just made like a what face. And like I'm used to doing multi-cam where people, like, the writers will laugh at their own stuff. No, this was the casting director. I was like... It was like, you know, you have your punchlines, right? Right. So here, I'll do a punchline. Okay. And then I walked into the room. (laughs) No. (laughs) Oh, no. What? What? And I just was like, oh, right. I should have. I should have emailed somebody. I've been like, never been in for this office before. Anyone experienced anything about this office I should know about? And somebody could say like, yeah, just to give you a heads up, they laugh at the laugh lines. So just be prepared for that. It's, yeah, it's exactly like this, right? that example, but for award season. And of course, your experience is just Mm -hmm. one in a gazillion. 100%. 100%. I'd like you to be aware so that way maybe you're prepared. And if you get your next series, if you get your first series, if you get your next one, I want you to know that these are the costs that you can incur so that you are asking and negotiating for them up front instead of being hammered by them at the end. I also feel like this is good to know because for me and I'm listening to your story, it makes me go like, oh, these are things I can decide whether or not I want to do. Yeah. Truly. Truly. You know, if it's worth it for I me love personally. That. I so love that because you don't have to do it, you guys. No. Nope. Like, I mean, I saw, that's really the, that's really like the, the truth of it is. Right. Right. And so you could just not. Or you can decide, you could cherry pick. Right. But yeah, listening to this definitely makes me think about what I have control of. Um, what you would decide to what do What I would decide year. to do, uh, talking it over with my team, mm-hmm. deciding as a team what would be helpful, mm-hmm. what not would not be helpful, mm-hmm. and then talking to 
um, my partner and then my therapist to decide emotionally, (laughs) you know, what you're going to do, what we're going to do. Cause Mm -hmm. when you're in a relationship, um, I happen to be, you know, have a husband, like, yes. you know, just making it sure and checking. Everybody. Yeah. In. Can I say about that? Something that I learned that I think would be really true for you, too, is I leave Jesse out of all of this stuff. I always do because, like, he doesn't, you know, if, like, I had a plus one, like, I maybe wouldn't have taken him. Maybe I would have, but maybe not. Because, like, it's a thing and he's an introvert, too. And, like, what, you know, what is he going to do is stand there and just be like, yes, He's going to stand here. there and get $40 worth of champagne <laughs> exactly. for you. Exactly. But here's the thing is that... I, I came home that night and Jesse was like, so how'd you do? And I said, um, I was like, I think I learned a really valuable lesson. Like, I think I, next time I'm going to need you there. Like, I'm just going to need you physically there. And what's hard is that I want to say my manager did, this is incredible of her. She flew out from She's Atlanta a rock star. for the actual day of, of the Emmys like she flew out and surprised me and was there and went to the party and all that but they can't go with you to the actual event and you know if I'm in the position to negotiate next time I'm going to make sure that I have a plus one and that plus one is him just because I need emotional support in those events and you need your emotional support animal which <laughs> is your Jessie. husband Jessie. Blue, i just need you i just put him in a little vest yes just walk down little, that little red carpet little emotional support vest <laughs> i would totally do that and he and you would know be he horrified. would 100 wear it <laughs> he would be like audrey i really don't want to wear this vest and i'd be like do it please for me and he'd be like okay because uh, he's such a good guy he's like the best that's awesome that you can yeah. see that now in retrospect i can't and so i really recommend for those of you too like and and this thing about cherry picking i think is important like i understand the the appetite for wanting to go for all of them in the beginning because what else did i know and and it feels and also, like you don't know when you're going to be there again right. and so like give it to me all of it i'll take all of it but yeah next time i'll be like okay which ones do i really want to spend more importantly than anything the energy what do I want to spend the energy on? And that's why with all these parties, you can see it's like only a few of the part people that you really want to see there are actually going. Because everyone else is actually working. <laughs> yeah, because they're fucking tired. And they're shooting on Monday. Yep. Right? They're shooting on Monday. They're shooting on Tuesday. M- Michelle Dockery flew in, was shooting uh, the Downton Abbey movie, flew in. Uh, they played for her flight. BTW. I mean, I don't have that confirmed, but I'm pretty confident. They flew her in, like, I think the night before she went to that, like, honorees party, no cameras party the night before, and then went to the Emmys and then flew out to go back and film and talk about jet lag, all that stuff. And it's like, that's a lot. It's grueling. It's grueling. That's a lot. And like, listen, champagne problems. I understand. I don't want to be like, totally an asshole about it but like just so you know as an actor when you're then going to do your work and the pressure to not disappoint people not disappoint your cast not disappoint either cast you know like if it were me and I want a feature film I would want to make sure I was managing my energy so that when I came back I was able to do my best work but also wanting to show up for my cast I'm nominated wanting to show up to represent my cast of the show that I've already completed and honor them it's a lot of energy but you can do it if you want to. You can. So thank you, Audrey. Yeah. Thank you so much for coming over. I know we went long. We'll edit it. And I really, um, I really appreciate you uh, coming in here. Did you find it helpful? It was super helpful. I learned so much. And I hope everyone who's listening learned a lot too. Um, where can we find you? You can find me at Audrey Helps Actors uh, on Instagram. And uh, we have the new voicemail if you have a listener question. 877 actor 70 that's nope i lied 677 <laughs> actor 70 that's 677 actor 70 be sure to call in and you where can you I can find, find you? me on instagram and twitter at real elizabeth ho yes don't follow that fake bitch <laughs> go for the real the one real one the I real you know, one her instagram is really fantastic you and can also follow my dogs please. at hangin with mr coops <laughs> h a N G I N W I T H M R C O O P S. They're magical. Those, They're fucking magical. Those dogs are really fucking magical. Okay, here, let me push stop. Next week on Audrey Helps Actors, 
We are doing listener questions. You guys have been giving me so many listener questions. So I do a little listener question follow up with the one Falcon de Henschel. Val Kenchel, who we've had uh, before on this uh, season one of this uh, podcast. That's what we're doing here is a podcast. And uh, he and I go through some listener questions and we answer your questions. So uh, look forward to that. Also, I want to really thank Elizabeth Ho. Congratulations, girl, on this pilot. I'm so happy for you. I'm so excited. You guys, we both found out that we were going to producers, obviously for different roles. And then she booked it, as you're supposed to do. And it's really a great win for her. I'm super excited and I can't wait to uh, hopefully go to a taping and watch you do your boss ass work. I adore you and uh, thank you for coming and interviewing me and for being so charming and also uh, asking so many great questions. This show is produced by Jesse Lumen, my now husband. What's up? You guys, he's still so handsome. This episode is edited by Patricia Cuffey Jones and Thomas Hank Snodgrass. Also shout out to Thomas for the mic assistance now and then. It's still good to have your sound guy across the street. Show music is brought to you by Ari De Niro. Theme song assistance is by Alok Mehta and 108 Hill. All right, you guys, don't forget your towel. 